All right, thank you, Andreas, and thank you, Jeff, for the previous presentation. Um, so, yeah, let's get going. So the first question is, who am I and why am I actually standing here in front of you? So, as Andreas just said, I'm in the architecture group in ARM, and within that, I'm in a specific team uh, which does power modeling. And we do various things. We actually will create standards. The idea behind these standards is to actually unite the ARM ecosystem. So these things like how you should do core bring up, how you should interface with various things like power management. Uh, then we do a fair amount of modeling. So this is where Gen5 actually comes into it. There are various things we design, uh, as in products we make with an ARM that we then need to get to work. And that means we have to create software for them, and the software has to work properly with the hardware. So we have to model this. And also, we sometimes find new problems. You have to understand them, design something to solve them, and implement them. And then, of course, there's the implementation of the power management solutions. So then we have to make sure we deliver high performance at low power. So that's more or less ARM in a nutshell. So why am I standing here, then? So we model past, present, and future systems in Gen 5, actually. And we need to understand the, decision, uh, the impact of the power decisions that are made. So we need to understand if a process is, uh, if a task is scheduled on a certain processor, is this energy efficient or not, for example? And as part of this, we use Gen 5 on a daily basis. And I've been working uh, with Gen 5 for the last six or so years. OK, so first of all, why do we want to model power in the first place? So when you're designing a system, both in terms of hardware and software, any decisions you make have a large impact on the power. So you basically need to, need to understand, are you doing it right or not? And one of the key things that I've actually looked at is modeling of big little systems and then looking at scheduling decisions on these. So ARM has something called the Energy Aware Scheduler. This thing that's been upstreamed to the Linux kernel. And it's a schedule which is designed to work across all systems irrespective of the architecture. So the idea behind it is that it understands the energy and performance impact of its decisions. So it understands a big core is so and so big, a little core is so and so small, and it understands the size of tasks and where to put them. However, we actually use Gen 5 as part of this to decide, OK, does it work for slightly strange architectures? If we give an engine model that doesn't match the system, does it actually do the right thing? So that is what we actually use Gen 5 for, amongst various other things. So Gen 5 is good because it gives us a single framework for doing this. So onto the actual power modeling itself. So as Jeff just mentioned, there are two sides to it. There's the static side and the dynamic side. Static side is more or less the energy consumed when it's leaking, not doing anything, whereas the dynamic side is then due to switching and very much affected by what's running on the system. So how do we go about modeling this in Gen 5? Well, roughly there are two equations. There's one for the static energy and one for the dynamic energy. However, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So first, you need information about the voltage in the system. Actually, what voltage you're running at, what frequency you're running at. This is linked to things like DVFS as well. Then you have power states. So each object will have various power states. It can be on, it can be in retention, it can be off. This greatly affects the amount of power consumed as well. And then finally, in Gen 5, we have the Gen 5 statistics, which gives all sorts of information about the switching activity. So this nicely links back to the models that Jeff was just talking about, uh, which more or less can then use these statistics to calculate the power. And on the right-hand side here, I've got a bit of an example system. And you can have various subsystems within this which would be then one for little cores, one for big cores, and one for the rest of the system. And the idea behind this is that you can give a power model to each of these and see where the power is consumed. So first of all, there's getting the voltage and frequency information. So Gen 5 has two domains, a clock domain and a voltage domain. A clock domain is essentially an ordered list of frequencies from highest to lowest. A voltage domain goes alongside the clock domain and has a voltage for every frequency uh, in the same order. And the idea is then you can come along, you can say, OK, I want to set a certain frequency. The clock domain itself handles the uh, voltage transition, and things work in tandem. The voltage domain is designed such a way that it actually wraps a, uh, sorry, the clock domain wraps a set of components. So you then have multiple components that live in the clock domain, and this is actually propagated by the hierarchy in Gen 5. So if we look on the right-hand side here again, if we have a system with two big cores in a clock domain and a voltage domain, in terms of, of what Gen 5 represents, you have a tree-like structure, we have a parent that there would actually be a subsystem in Gen 5. So this is then a wrapper around the different components. The subsystem, subsystem itself has a voltage domain and a clock domain, and then the two big cores would sit within that. These can then actually resolve where their clock and voltage domains are, and then update their clocks and voltages accordingly. So a small aside, now that you have these clock and voltage domains, you actually need to be able to control the frequency at which you're running. And this comes in two parts. First of all, there's the DVFS handler. This is essentially a bit of magic Gen 5 hardware, which sits there and has a list of domains it should control. 
each domain um, will be assigned a domain ID, which should match that of the CPUs in that domain. You then have the NG controller. So this is the blob that talks to the operating systems. The idea behind this is that it reports all the available frequencies to the OS. There's a driver that lets this interface with the CPU for in, uh, interface in Linux. And then from your simulated system, you can go and you can just change the voltages and frequencies accordingly. This all is populated at boot up and should just work out of the box. And if you want to actually use this, then the uh, code is on the uh, repository list at the bottom. So next there, the power states. So you actually have to understand, is a component on, is it off, is it potentially in WFI? So Gen5 by default, for all components apart from the DRM controller, has five power states. The first one is undefined. This means we don't know what state is in. So yeah, we don't know what to do. It has no state transitions. Then the other four ones that you can actually transition through. So if you're on, then you're running flat out. If you're clock gated, then obviously your clock is stopped. If you're attention, then yeah, it's all fairly self-explanatory, I think. Um, each power state actually consumes a different amount of power. So that means you need to potentially model these things differently. Uh, one thing to note here is that CPU models will go and transition between these states. And for other components, you typically have to derive this from the CPU state. So if you've got L1 cache attached to the CPU, you have to look at what the CPU is doing to determine what the L1 cache is doing. Uh, one thing that will change sometime soon uh, is that we are working on something called PSCI, which is the Power State Coordination Interface. So this is actually an ARM standard, and we're working on implementing this in Gen 5, and there should be some patches coming out fairly soon. And this allows you to do things like turn the CPUs on and off through this interface. So then you get micro power modeling as well as performance modeling. The other thing that comes into this are actually thermal domains. So there is thermal in Gen 5. Uh, so the static power is actually very heavily affected by the temperature, so you need to make sure you model this uh, in Gen 5. So the thermal domains have essentially an RC network to model the, the thermal characteristics. So you've got the thermal resistance, which is essentially how much it will heat up per watt, uh, sorry, per, yes, per watt you put in, just making sure I've got the right way around. And you've got the thermal capacitance, which is more or less the amount of energy that is used when heating it by one watt. And these two things allow you to actually model how the device heats up and cools down. And there's also an initial temperature. So you need to say you start off at room temperature, for example. We then have a couple of feedback loops where the temperature feeds into the power side of things and the power feeds into the temperature. So each time you calculate these, you go out this loop and you make sure these things are actually updated in tandem. So the final thing we then need are the Gen 5 statistics. So voltage and clock periods are reported in the Gen 5 statistics, so those are all there and can be used. And these are reported per clock domain and per voltage domain. The same actually applies to the power state residency. So the Gen 5 statistics give you output in terms of the CPU spent 50% of its time in the on state, the rest of the time in the WFI state. Uh, the switching activity, as I mentioned earlier on, is also included here. So this is where you can use the models that Jeff was talking about. And all these can then combine to calculate the power dissipation. And one thing you have to make sure you do, and the system automatically does, is it dumps the statistics when you change frequency. If you didn't do this, you end up averaging over multiple frequencies, multiple voltages, and you end up with fairly bad power numbers. So then when you make frequency transition, you want to make sure you dump them. So now onto that raw power models. So the power model itself is a SIM object in Gen 5. It again is part of the subsystem. And it has two equations. It has static and dynamic. However, it actually has multiple sets of these equations, one set per power state. Then you have one equation for the on state, one for in clock gated, and so forth. And there are two methods. These are get dynamic power and get static power. Again, it's fairly self-explanatory. And the power that's returned in these is weighted by the amount of time you spend in each state. So each time you do a statistics dump, it calculates the power, and it weights this according to the percentage of time it spends in each of the states. And you get one power number, or one dynamic power number, one static power number coming out of this. And it actually wraps the part that does all the work. And that, that is the math expression power model. So what this does is it actually lets you specify an equation. And this is actually where you can encode the sorts of models that Jeff had. So here you can say, I've got these coefficients for these different parameters. You encode them here. You can actually go and reference the different objects in the subsystem to calculate your power. And out of this, a power number will drop. And you again have two equations, one for dynamic and one for static. So in terms of the big picture, it roughly looks like this. You have the CPU freak framework in Linux that is used to control the frequencies. Uh, via the engine control and the DFS handler. The clock domains will go and adjust the voltage of the voltage domains. The output from both those in terms of frequency and voltage are fed into the power models along with the Gen 5 statistics. 
those will then also talk to the thermal model to calculate what the temperature should be. And based upon all of this, when you do a stat stump, you can write this out into the statistics file. And yeah, then you get your overall power coming out there. So I just want to give a quick example of how you bring it all together. So this would be modeling one of the ARM test systems, more or less. So there's an ARM platform called Juno. And the idea behind this is you have four little cores, two big cores. And we model something similar to that in Gen 5, and we want to see what we could get for the power numbers. We actually use worker automation to run these experiments. So this was mentioned in a Nuke talk earlier on. If you didn't see it, these slides should be online sometime soon. And the one thing I want to note is that WA runs are non-deterministic. This means if you run the same thing multiple times, each run will be different. And that's because you're interacting with the host system instead of just in Gen 5. And we do a quick experiment where we sample the power at two different intervals. Once every second, once every millisecond. So these are the two different runs we do. So our system ends up looking something like this. You've got the four big cores in a clock and a voltage domain. You then have the, four, uh, the two little cores, again, in a clock and a voltage domain. All of those sit in a the thermal domain. We do the same sort of thing for the DRAM, and then we do it for the system as a whole. And then what comes out of this is something that looks a bit more like, like this. So these are plots of power over time. Please note that the big core power is normalized to the maximum of the big core power. The little core power is normalized to the maximum of the little core power. Well, arm, we can't make any statements about the, uh, the relative power consumption of things as such, at least not from Gen 5, so I'm not going to do that. And you essentially, on the left-hand side, it's really hard to see what's going on in the system, whereas on the right-hand side, you get a lot of detail. And you will, one thing to note is that because you dump the statistics when you change the frequency, you end up with a bit more detail on the on the one-second sampling interval one than you'd expect, but it's still enough to figure out what's going on. However, on the right-hand side, you have a lot of detail. You can actually start digging into this. You can look at the fine slices, see what the workload is doing. And the thing I didn't mention earlier on is we run two workloads. So we run dry stone on six threads. So that runs across all the cores in the system. This is a very CPU-intensive application. And this runs for, I don't know, half a second or so. And then we run memcopy on a single little core. And we can actually see this reflected in the output powers. So if we, I don't know if this will work. No, nah, not really. Uh, that might be slightly better. So if we look here, this is where you'd actually be running dry stone on the little cores and here on the big cores. And here you can either see that one of the threads finished or there's a frequency transition. And then here you can actually see memcopy running on the little cores. Uh, so, yeah, the main thing to note here, though, is you have a huge trade-off in terms of the output file size. So, the right-hand side was about 400 megabytes compressed, which means it's probably around 4 gigs uncompressed, whereas the, uh, the left-hand side is only 1.7 megabytes. So, that means you have to trade off your output fidelity for the file size. So, essentially, there's no free lunch, just as Radica said earlier on. And this does lead me into the final part of the presentation, which is more or less lunch.